So this, this talk is going to be the first of three talks of using the three vessel view to evaluate uh, uh, different kinds of defects. I'm actually going to focus on the defects themselves and that's on purpose and that's because I don't want people to think that we can use the three vessel view instead of looking at the outflow fract. It's an adjunct and it can be a very powerful adjunct, uh, um, particularly with, in cases where you don't see the arches really well and so on and so forth. But it's certainly not to replace uh, uh, um, evaluation of the alpha tracks. So I, I will be showing some three vessel views and I figure I'd start in the beginning since this is the first of three talks on three vessel view, I need to go over three vessel view a little bit, but that, that's not gonna be the focus of my talk. So, <laughs> so let's see, this is a three vessel view. Uh, it's classic, I, I like the three vessel tracheal view. I use that more than the three vessel uh, view a little bit lower, but this is the three vessel tracheal view. You could see the trachea here, uh, and then you can see starting on the left, the PA, and then the a AO coming together as a V, and then the superior vena cava and cross section, PAS in that order. And there's no additional SVC. And of course you put color on, it gives you a, draw, a lot more information in terms of uh, direction of flow, the size, the number of vessels, the size of the vessels, where they are, all very important. And of course, it's not as not easy always to get a really nice three vessel view but it's a very powerful view. These are just some very nice images I borrowed from my uh, dear friend, Tracy Anton, who's a clinical instructor uh, down in uh, UC San Diego, just showing basics of the three vessel view, showing the pulmonary artery bifurcation. You could see here the pulmonary bifurcation and she has a nice schematic on the side. And here you could see the LP and the RPA as she demonstrates. Then you could see the aorta, and then you could see the superior vena cava. This is the three vessel view. Sometimes it's one of the best views to look at the branch pulmonary arteries themselves. Three vessel tracheal view is the view that I just showed you before with the V sign showing that it's a left aortic arch plus a lot more information besides that. If you look here, you could see on the left, the, as we move the image, you could see the V. You could see uh, the V is formed right here on the left. This is of course, the trachea, and then what is this? This is the thymus anteriorly. Very powerful view. Um, I'm not gonna be spending most of this talk specifically about three vessel, only to use it as a way to help evaluate some of these defects. Uh, so, um, and by the way, Tracy has a very nice uh, paper in the Journal of the Ultras Journal of Ultrasound of Medicine by AIUM three vessel review, a tutorial of the three vessel view. I encourage you to see if you could take a look at that. So global detection rates for major heart disease. I've shown you this paper before, but now let's look at how we are doing around the world for pulmonary stenosis or pulmonary atresia, coarctation and aortic stenosis. This is pulmonary atresia. Of course, pulmonary stenosis may be more difficult to detect. It's more subtle. Pulmonary atresia is the severe form where there's no flow across the pulmonary valve. If you take these top locations out, the vast majority have less than 50% uh, detection rates uh, here in parts of the United States. It's down to 15%. Uh, so, but generally speaking, a, a lot of room for improvement for detection of pulmonary, that's all for pulmonary atresia, pulmonary stenosis detection rates would be even worse. Coarctation, no, let's go to aortic stenosis, leave coart last. Aortic stenosis also, it's an alpha tract abnormality. So generally alpha tract abnormalities are harder for people to detect. Uh, then four chamber view abnormalities, which is a shame, of course, and it's unfortunate because as we talked about, alpha tract abnormalities are probably more important to detect than four vessel view abnormalities in the sense that they're more likely to be ductal dependent. But so aortic stenosis, if you look at the detection rates for these countries, uh, varies from anywhere to zero to 2% up to maybe um, 30%, 40%. These are outliers up here and the outliers are 60%. So you could see Aortic stenosis, uh, very poor detection rates around the world. Coartation, um, generally speaking, it's one of the most challenging uh, major forms of heart disease to detect in the fetus, that along with total anomalous pulmonary venous return. Coart is extremely difficult and we need to get much better and find better ways to detect coartation. You can see detection rates all the way from 0%, 5% up to 40%, 42%. Other than these outliers, even the outliers are not a high of 66%. So 
So the vast majority of cases of cohort still being missed uh, with prenatal screening. So we're going to talk first about uh, aortic stenosis. You can see aortic stenosis here on the left, two cases of aortic stenosis, and I'll go over those in detail. So the fact that we can detect bicuspid valve prenatally, bicuspid valve, uh, as you know, uh, um, uh, has a prevalence of perhaps 1%, uh, um, depending upon the study you've looked at. The normal aortic valve has three leaflets and three commissures, but sometimes there's one of the commissures is fused, so you have a functional bicuspid aortic valve. And you can see that here on the right. You can see this right picture, the right clip corresponds with the bicuspid aortic valve here in the schematic on the left. It opens up like a fish mouth, clear, very clearly. This is not always an easy image short axis view to get, um, and it's certainly not part of a routine study, but with, with practice and with some time, you can try to get this view in many cases to see if it's a bicuspid valve or not. This is a normal aortic valve. It's sort of, we call it a Mercedes sign because it looks like a Mercedes Benz sign in a normal. And over here, you can see it's a bicuspid valve. Now, bicuspid aortic valve, I mentioned because bicuspid aortic valve, first of all, bicuspid valve, aortic valve is important in and of itself because it can progress to become aortic stenosis even in utero or in certainly after birth during adulthood. Um, and also, bicuspid aortic valve can be associated with coarctation of the aorta. So, if we detect a bicuspid aortic valve even without stenosis, we always want to make sure to follow them up after birth because of the possibility of coarctation. And uh, also, of course, if there's bicuspid aortic valve, some of those can be associated with genetic syndromes. So aortic stenosis. Let's look here at my favorite view on the left. You can see the long axis. You look at the aortic valve. It opens and closes. It disappears during systole. It's thin and delicate. It's symmetric. It opens up in the middle. It closes in the middle, rather. It's, it's a very beautiful, normal-appearing valve. Always should be able to look at the valve in every single case, fetal case that you look at, so you get used to the normal. And here on the right, you can see how this is dramatically different. The valve is thickened. It does not disappear uh, during, during systole. Um, and uh, this is a case of mild to moderate aortic valve stenosis. Now this case, the, again on the left, is normal. On the right, when I first started scanning, I thought, well, it's probably normal. I'm probably just not getting good image, which is usually the case. You need, I needed to open up the ear to bow better. But in this case, it turned out to be real, that this was really a very small, diminutive, thickened ear to bow with severe stenosis. So this is a case of severe ear to stenosis. Um, again, all cases of ear stenosis should be followed and should have a postnatal echo at the very least before they go home because of the possible association with coarctations. Coarctation of the area, which I'll talk about later, you do not want to miss that. You do not, not, you do not want to take those, send those babies home without having a postnatal evaluation. So with severe aortic stenosis, this is the sagittal view of uh, aortic stenosis. So we're not looking at the valve, we're looking downstream at the aortic arch. Here you can see the aortic arch looks a little bit diminutive, but here you can see there's retrograde flow. So even in the absence of coarctation, um, su significant coarctation, severe aortic stenosis, you can have retrograde flow in the aortic arch just because there's so little left ventral tract uh, blood flow because of the aortic stenosis. And here's a three vessel view. Uh, I promised we'd have some three vessel view shots. This is a three vessel view. Another way to look at uh, this, you could see the pulmonary artery in, in blue with prograde flow and the aorta <coughs> in red with retrograde flow. It looks a little bit diminutive, but here the main message is that you can show retrograde flow in the aortic arch, which clearly is abnormal. And in this case, it's because of severe aortic stenosis. So there's a whole, uh, we could spend a, a full 15, 20, 30, half hour, an hour of discussion about when to intervene, when to intervene in utero, which we will not be doing today in the interest of time. But of course, some select cases of severe aortic stenosis may evolve if left untreated to hypoplastic left heart syndrome in utero. Some will not evolve. Um, and those among those that may evolve, there may be some who are good candidates for in utero balloon dilation of the aortic valve to help prevent the development of hypoplastic left heart syndrome. That's a whole other discussion. Um, uh, I think Balu talked about some of the kinds of uh, things we look at to see 
which cases are going to evolve. We, um, but uh, be that as may, it's the, the, this all begins with the detection of an aortic valve abnormality. That's the single most important step um, that we need to work on. So um, that's, uh, that's the aortic valve stenosis. Very important um, because it's so common, can be associated with coarctation and of course can be ductal dependent when the baby's born and you want those babies to deliver at the right centers where we can take care of the valve. Severe aortic stenosis, we may want to balloon the valve soon after the baby's born after starting them in prostaglandin or they may need surgery, either repairing the valve, doing a Ross operation where we put the pulmonary valve in the aortic position and then giving a new pulmonary homograph. Um, in any case, those are babies that need to be identified prenatally so that we can optimize the postnatal management. Now we're going to shift gears and talk a little bit about pulmonary stenosis. So these are normal pulmonary valves. You can see on the left, the pulmonary valve is thin and delicate, symmetric. It disappears during systole. And here on the right, another case, same thing, thin and delicate. It disappears during systole and during diastole, you see it. Um, and actually, it's interesting, the pulmonary valve in this view during during Diastole, when you see the valve, it usually is closes uh, perpendicular to the long axis of the, of the pulmonary artery. The aortic valve often will, uh, will close, but it will be parallel to long axis. In any case, the key is to look at the valves moving very closely to optimize the imaging um, so that you can see if they look normal or not, and then, of course, put color on them to see what the, flower, the color fill file looks like to figure out if it's really a normal valve or not. So here on the left is a normal pulmonary valve, normal aortic valve, again, thin and delicate, um, disappearing during systole. And here we could see again, the pulmonary valve, so notice how it's perpendicular to the long axis of the pulmonary artery during diastole. So now we can look at full pulmonary, now that we know, are comfortable identifying when a valve is normal or not, when the pulmonary valve looks normal, then we can start to be in a better position to decide whether the valve is abnormal. Here with 2D, you don't need color on this baby. This baby clearly has, this fetus clearly has a very dysplastic, thickened, asymmetric pulmonary valve that does not disappear uh, during systole. And you can see already that this is um, going to be a, a significant form of pulmonary stenosis. Now we put color flow on it, and it helps to show the jet going across the valve it's a very narrow jet, and there's some, uh, the red flow is the pulmonary regurgitation. Often they, we see these in combination with pulmonary valve abnormalities. So once we identify pulmonary stenosis, of course, we need to see if there's other abnormalities in the heart. We need to follow these babies because of the potential for progression. Um, but even, even mild or, or even moderate or moderate severe forms of pulmonary valve stenosis can progress and may be ductal dependent when they're born. And, but these babies generally uh, respond well to pulmonary valve dilation unless there's a significant amount of uh, pulmonary regurgitation, in which case we can't afford to dilate them because we might make the pulmonary regurgitation worse. Some subtle clues for mild forms of pulmonary stenosis, we, looking at the atrial septum, sometimes with pulmonary stenosis that can increase the afterflow that the RV sees, which can translate into elevated right atrial mean pressure, which will deviate the flap of the frame once further into the left atrium than you'll normally see at a certain point in gestation. Another clue is using color. Sometimes the first clue to a subtle abnormality of the pulmonary valve is the pulmonary regurgitation, and you want to optimize the color just like you optimize 2D imaging. If you don't optimize the color, you have a lot of false positives. A lot of time you'll think there's pulmonary regurg and there's not. Um, but if there is pulmonary regurgitation, you're going to want to follow up those babies because those are cases that potentially the pulmonary valve may progress. I've never seen a case where the pulmonary valve looks normal at 20 weeks, has regurgitation, and progresses to severe stenosis. But I have seen cases like that that progress to mild to moderate pulmonary stenosis. So it's not something you want to miss. Um, and that all it takes is detailed 2D imaging and detailed color flow Doppler. It's nice, of course, while we're talking about pulmonary valve abnormalities to mention that we always want to evaluate in, in, in fetal echo, not necessarily in a low risk screen, but in fetal echo, we want to look at both branch pulmonary arteries. And I mentioned this before, if you look either on the left or on the right, in the middle, 
you could see the branches. You could see the two branches, and then coming up, you see the ductus. See that two branches, and then the duct showing in the middle screen. First branch is RPA, LPA, LPA overlies the ductus. If you go sagittally, sometimes you could see a trifurcation. You could see the R, the MPA, uh, uh, bifurc or trifurcating the RPA first, then the LPA, and then the ductus. And you could see that way on the right here as well. This is a little easier on the right. MPA trifurcating into RPA, LPA, ductus. RPA, LPA, ductus. RPA, LPA, ductus. It's really important to always in a fetal echo to be able to see the MPA having three branches, the RP, LP, and the ductus. You may not be able to see them all in one plane. It's certainly nice if you do, but you need to make sure you see all three. So with severe stenosis, of course, there's going to be significant color flow abnormalities as well. You can see the turbulence here, and here the valve doesn't disappear. There may be abnormalities in the RV. The RV may hypertrophy. Um, in rare cases, there can be heart failure. And so in a very small, very, very small percentage of cases, sometimes they may, they may be, these may be candidates for, um, for uh, in utero dilation of the pulmonary valve. Very unusual though. And of course, there's going to be retrograde flow. If you have severe pulmonary stenosis, you're going to have retrograde flow going in. And you can see that on sagittal views, entering the ductus retrograde, or on the three vessel, three vessel view, you'll see retrograde flow. And that'll be a clue that this is a baby who will be ductal dependent before pulmonary blood flow should be delivered at a center where we can start prostaglandin and ideally intervene um, to allow this baby to go home. Okay. So the, the, as I mentioned before, the extreme form of pulmonary stenosis within intact septum is pulmonary atresia with intact septum, where you actually have zero flow across the pulmonary valve. These cases um, actually develop variable degrees of RV hypoplasia and tricuspid valve abnormalities as well. If you look here on the right, you can see the left heart looks great, but it looks like there's tricuspid atresia. There's no flow into the RV. This is not a case of tricuspid valve atresia, though. It's a case of pulmonary atresia, but there's no flow out of the RV, so there's very little flow into the RV. So sometimes it's, it's essentially a form of tricuspid atresia, but it's functional tricuspid atresia. Although in some of these cases, of course, you can have both pulmonary atresia and tricuspid atresia. But these cases of severe pulmonary stenosis or pulmonary atresia within intact septum will have a hypertrophy to right ventricle and a tricuspid valve that doesn't, does not open up very well, or maybe not at all, as in, in this case. And these are very important cases to identify prenatally uh, because we want to optimize their care after birth. They are going to require intervention before they go home. And the prognosis that we can start to, uh, to evaluate prenatally relates in large part to the tricuspid valve, how thick it is what size annulus uh, there is, how much regurgitation there is, as well as the right ventricle. How well formed is it? Does it form the apex? How, what is the function like? How hypertrophied is it? These are all elements that we can identify prenatally to help us when we counsel patients in terms of what we expect, because there's a wide variation in outcome and approach and prognosis for babies with pulmonary atresia and intact septum from very good, um, very good prognosis with two ventricle repairs to guarded prognosis with single ventricle repairs. Here's, a, here's some cases showing the tricuspid regurgitation. Many of these cases have significant tricuspid regurgitation. And here you could see the RV classic appearance of pulmonary atresia intact septum looking at the four chamber. This is very classic, very thick in RV, diminished a function with a tricuspid valve that does not open. If you look closely, you'll see the valve is not opening very well in either of these cases. This, this is a classic appearance of pulmonary atresia and tech septum. Here you can see the RV on top on the left screen. It's hypoplastic. And you can see the pulmonary valve on the left screen. When we sweep to the valves, it's not moving at all right here. And over here, you can see the same thing. Pulmonary valve is not moving at all. There's pulmonary atresia. Now, one of the most feared complications that occurs in pulmonary atresia and taxeptin is these abnormalities in the coronary arteries. We call them RV to coronary artery sinusoids, where communications from the RV itself to the coronary artery system, which can be associated with abnormalities in the coronary such that, that they put the, at risk the myocardium for myocardial ischemia. 
even prenatally, but certainly postnatally, uh, because of the anatomy that we might be seeing in the pulmonary artery. Sometimes there's no prograde flow to the myocardium in terms of coronary flow, except from the RV, their so-called RV-dependent coronary circulation. And that has dramatic impact in terms of how we manage these babies postnatally and in terms of their prognosis. And we can actually see these sinusoids when we look carefully prenatally. Um, they often look like VSDs. And I know that um, uh, Dr. Alpana discussed this really nicely, so I won't spend much time here. They often will look like VSDs. Um, we often will need to cap these babies after birth to evaluate them even more closely. But they can be identified prenatally and they just look like very diffuse ventricular septal defects. Here's a very large one coming from the RV, then going up, and then coming into the aorta. Very large. And these have significant prognostic implications. Sometimes these babies need to be listed for transplant. And sometimes we can look at the atrial septum. Again, pulmonary atresia, the RV is very hypertrophy. You can see on the left, the foramen ovale will often be deviated over. It's unusual for there to be significant um, restriction at the level of the foramen ovale, but it's possible for these cases because, of course, they're dependent upon shunting across the foramen ovale because there's no other egress from the right ventricle. So that's pulmonary, pulmonary stenosis slash pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum, wide variation in prognosis and management approaches. And very important to follow those babies during the pregnancy because you can advance and progress. Now we're gonna finish this talk. We're talking about coarctation, which is, requires a uh, huge amount of discussion in and of itself because it's so challenging to pick up and so important to pick up. When we, know, when we identify coarctation before babies leave the hospital, ideally before they're born, the outcome is generally very good. Because uh, if it's an isolated coarctation, as you see in this picture on the left, the, 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 the approach to management is starting them on prostaglandin that keeps the ductus open until they go to the operating room where you repair the arch, and then they're, they're good to go for the most part. Sometimes there's recurrence, but they have very good prognosis. Whereas if we miss it and they send, babies are sent home without suspecting cohort, by the time these babies come to medical attention, it's often too late. Here's a, a sagittal view of the aortic arch. You could see a couple suggestions of cohort. One is that the left subclavian way down here is very displaced, a long distance from the preceding um, head and neck vessel. And the isthmus itself is very small. It's hard to see here, but that's, ex that's very small uh, as well, which is a very important sign for coartation, but not always so easy to see. So we always want to find ways to detect coartation that people can identify at the routine screen. This view on the right, of course, is not a screening view. We don't look sadly at the arch of low-risk pregnancies. But we do look at the four-chamber view, right? So here's some four-chamber views. These are, what are some of the clues to coartation that we see at the level of the four-chamber view that we see here? You could probably identify many of them. First, there's right heart disproportion, right? The right heart is clearly bigger than the left heart, more so than it should be. You can see that in both, both clips. You can see the pericardial fusion. Sometimes that can be a sign of coarctation of the aorta. You could see on the left side here, a dilated coronary sinus. Also, you could see here, 11 for dilated coronary sinus because it reflects a probable persistent LSVC. That can be associated with coarctation of the aorta. All those are uh, um, signs or suggestions or hints or clues for the possibility of coarctation of the aorta. Whenever we identify an LSVC to coronary sinus prenatal, I always have those, those patients get echocardiograms after the babies are born, before they leave the hospital, just to be sure, even if there's no other suggestion of cohort, just to be sure that there's no coarctation of the aorta. So here's again a parasitic short you could see on the left. Maybe it's a bicuspidic valve, but clearly there's disproportion between the pulmonary artery and, and the aorta. And here on the right, you can see the dilated coronary sinus. And here it does look like it's probably a bicuspid aortic valve as well. This is, a, again, back to the three vessel view. We could see what's abnormal with this three vessel view, suggesting cohort. First, the pulmonary artery to the aorta size discrepancy, right? Pulmonary artery is very big, the aorta is small. Second, with cohort flow, you see the retrograde flow in the aorta. That's not normal. 
And then third is that we have a, uh, an extra SVC and LSVC. All of those are in suggestions of coarctation. Here on the right without color, it's a different fetus. Again, it's a four vessel view. You can see the big PA, smaller aorta, and you can see the bilateral SVCs. So clusive diagnosis uh, that can be readily seen with screening views. Bicus aortic valve, not, sometimes difficult to tell, but aortic stenosis, always be looking at the aortic valve. If it's not a normal valve, think, think about coarctation of the aorta. Left-sided SVC, smallly sending aorta, Dr. Anuutnawin, Sanitra Anuutnawin um, was visiting MFM from Thailand, spent time together, and she wrote up a paper showing in our experience the ascending aorta being small is an independent risk factor for coarctation. And that's also something that's relatively easy to see with screening. Unlike the distal arch near the isthmus, unless, as Balu mentioned, we use a three-vessel view when we move, and we look closely at the, at the isthmus from that way. Small mitral valve, we see that on a, on, um, for, on a routine screen. And if you're not sure, we can measure the valve analyst, see if the Z, what the Z-score is. But you need to make sure that you measure it correctly. It's very difficult sometimes to get an accurate measurement of the mitral valve. It needs to be at maximum excursion. Um, as I think Dr. Alpana was mentioning earlier during diastole and right heart disproportion. Those are clues to diagnosis of coarctation. Um, this is uh, just a paper that our former fellow, Dr. Sonia Hetty, um, wrote, Neonate and imagine a prenatal suspected cort because at UCLA, as in many places, we're very conservative if there's any suggestion of coarctation, LSVC, bicuspid valve, um, uh, we're worried at all. We, do, we always want to make sure that those babies get echocardiograms before they leave the hospital. But then the question is, how aggressive do you bring those babies to the NICU? Do you start them on prostaglandin? The answer is no, <laughs> not routinely. Um, but what do you do? How do you manage them so that you limit uh, any unnecessary morbidity to those fetuses, that those newborns that are actually normal, whereas but you, while not by while limiting the number of babies that you miss. You don't want to miss these babies. You don't want to get them in trouble. So it's, a, it's an important area because we tend to want to be very conservative when we're suspecting coartation prenatally. So finally, take home points for this talk. Current rates of early detection for coartation or stenosis, pulmonary stenosis are all really poor, very poor, particularly for outro, those outflow tract lesions around the world and most parts of the world. Uh, always evaluate the aortic and pulmonary valves very closely, at least as well as you evaluate the, the mitral and tricuspid valves. The aortic and pulmonary valves are probably even more important to evaluate very closely. There can be mild or subtle abnormalities of either valve that can progress, and particularly the aortic valve, if it's abnormal, this is a baby who may have coarctation of the aorta. As I mentioned, aortic and pulmonary stenosis may progress prenatally, although it's not going to go from very mild at second trimester all the way to severe, but it may progress. Coartation of the aorta, of course, remains very challenging to detect, so we all need to do everything we can to improve detection rates, and in the meantime, have a very low bar for following these babies up after birth, at least with an echocardiogram. And finally, again, the, my message that I mentioned before is that translation of prenatal detection of congenital heart disease into optimal outcomes requires not just the detection, but then a collaboration between maternal fetal medicine, OB, and pediatric cardiologists, those people taking care of the mother and then the newborn um, to, about, to allow the baby to be delivered in the optimal place and the optimal way to assure an optimal outcome. So with that, I think we'll stop. So I don't know if there's time for questions or comments from my colleagues. Thank you.